Welcome to this installment of True Crime Storytime, where I'll recap and examine interesting cases from the American criminal justice system. I do my best to report each case accurately, and I mean no disrespect to any victims or people that love them. Tonight's register is Gene Harrington, the cling wrap killer. Let's get into it. On July 10th, 2014, Officers from the Avon Lake Police Department showed up at the home of 55-year-old Jean Harrington and placed her in handcuffs. The arrest was the culmination of a three-year investigation. It had all begun with a 911 call placed by Jean on August the 16th back in 2011. She called to report that Upon returning home from running errands, she discovered her husband, 55-year-old Michael Gable, dead in the den of an apparent suicide. Miss Harrington was taken down to the Lorain County Detention Center and appeared in court two days later where serious charges were laid, murder, felony murder, two counts of felonious assault, and tampering with evidence. Her bail was initially set at $500,000, but she appeared in court the next day to request a lower bond. She did eventually make bail and was released. Jean Harrington and Michael Gable lived in the beautiful city of Avon Lake in northeastern Ohio. Michael worked as a car salesman and Jean worked at a public library gift shop. They had an 11-year-old son and owned a couple rental properties together. Both had been previously married, and at that point, their children from the first marriages were grown. Jean had a son, and Michael had a daughter. On August the 16th, 2011, Jean had gone shopping with her and Michael's son, and when they returned, they found Michael on the couch of the den in an unusual condition. His entire head was encased in cling wrap. Not just one layer either, it had been wrapped around and around his head so tightly that it smashed his lips and nose against his face. His body was cool to the touch. She also noticed a folded piece of paper on the coffee table near Michael's body. She picked it up. It turned out to be a typewritten letter from Michael. It said, This is the only way I will be able to feed and provide for my family. Michael Gable's name was signed in ink in the space below and typed out just beneath the signature. And that's when Jean had called 911. She told the operator about Michael and the note, adding that Michael had recently gotten a letter from the IRS demanding $17,000 and that the day after that, a letter from a collection company came saying he owed them $16,000. On top of all that, the bank had foreclosed on their house and it was going up for auction tomorrow. He was supposed to be fixing a plumbing issue while she was gone so that the house would fetch more at auction. It must have all been just too much for him, Jean said. When the police arrived, they went in the wrong direction. They headed to the living room instead of the den. Jean didn't try to redirect the police. She let them wander from living room into another one of the bedrooms, and eventually one officer entered the den and found Michael in a cramped room. There were moving boxes stacked up all around and items such as packing tape and marking pens on the table nearby. Also on the table was the suicide note. Jean was interviewed by Sergeant Victoria Reitnor, who later described her demeanor as very calm and matter-of-fact. She told the sergeant that at around 2 a.m. the night before, she and Michael had argued about the fact that they were losing their home. Each blamed the other. She said that the argument had descended into pushing and hair-pulling and that she'd ended up using her taser on Michael. She said he settled down after that and begged her not to call the police on him. The two of them had then gone to separate areas of the house, and she went to bed. She said she heard him walking around in the house and coming out of the bathroom at various points during the night, but she hadn't seen him again until that afternoon when she and her son came back from shopping and found him unresponsive. She also told them about the couple's financial crisis and revealed that Michael had a gambling addiction. 
The police checked Jean for injuries. She had bruises on the inside of her arm and one on her hand. She told the police that the injury to her hand came from Michael biting her. She gave CSI permission to process the house and the coroner's van arrived to take Michael downtown. Later that night, Jean called the bank and left a voicemail informing them of Michael's suicide. She asked if they could reconsider the foreclosure in light of these events and told them that she understood how frustrated they had been about how far behind the couple was on their mortgage payments. But that was over now, she said. She would be handling the money now and would definitely be able to make the payments on time and in full. Dr. Frank Miller is the Lorraine County Medical Examiner who performed Michael's autopsy. He was able to determine that asphyxiation, specifically suffocation, was the cause of death, but he wasn't completely sold on the suicide for a few reasons. For one thing, the cling wrap, which he described as restaurant-sized, was exceptionally tight around Michael's face. It seemed improbable that a person would be able to do that to themselves. There were also other injuries to his body, some 20 separate burn marks and bruises to his neck and head, as well as rug burn type marks on his wrists, knees, and ankles. Also, he'd never heard of a suicide by cling wrap before. When the police came back after meeting with the coroner and asked about these injuries, Jean replied, well, I tased him about 20 times. I zapped him all over. None of this came as a surprise to these officers. The police had been out to that house on multiple occasions over the years. Sometimes it would be Michael calling about something Jean had done. Sometimes it was the other way around. Once, Michael had even called the police to report that Jean was threatening to kill herself by putting a bag over her head. Now, Dr. Miller wasn't alone in his suspicions. Jean had told the police that she and her husband had fought in the den, yet they noted that, though there were boxes stacked all around, nothing was knocked over, not even the packing tape and scissors on the table. They also described her behavior during questioning as bizarre. They said she kept going off on tangents and blaming Michael for the couple's financial problems. And even the coroner had never heard of this cling wrap suicide. Of all the ways a desperate person could kill themselves, who would choose that? But there were no witnesses to contradict Jean's version of events, and it would take years to gather the evidence they needed for it in an indictment. So Jean was basically free to resume her life. Over the next three years, the police spoke to a number of people familiar with the couple and the state of their marriage. Several of these people testified at her trial, which began in the spring of 2016, including two friends of Jean that had briefly lived with her about six years before Michael's death. These women were going through tough times and Jean had invited them to stay. The first friend had lived with Jean and her family during the summer of 2009. She told police that she hadn't even known what Michael's name was until after she moved in that Jean always referred to him as idiot brain outside of the home. She said Jean didn't charge her any rent, but that she had to agree not to mention to Michael that Jean had a secret side job working as a church secretary. This friend had been trained as a pharmacy technician, and she said Jean often questioned her about different types of drugs and what amounts were necessary to kill a person. She also said that Jean had told her about a story she read where a woman had drugged and then killed her husband by sitting on him and suffocating him. According to the friend, the woman ended up getting caught because her DNA was on the man's face. And Jean said that if she ever did that to Michael, she would put saran wrap under her rear end first. By the time of that interview, Police had already received the complete autopsy and toxicology results. They knew that Dr. Miller had found an elevated amount of Benadryl in Michael's system, which the doctor said could easily be mixed with food and given to him without his knowledge. The amount of Benadryl they found in Michael's system wasn't enough to knock him out, 
but it certainly would have slowed him down and dulled his reflexes. There was also a partially digested meal in Michael's stomach, evidence that he had recently eaten before his death. The second woman stayed with Jean, Michael, and their son in 2010. She also said that Jean often called him idiot brain when he wasn't around. She said Jean told her that Michael had forced her to sign over her house to him and that he had forged her signature on mortgages to pay off his gambling debts. Both women also said that Michael and Jean slept in separate bedrooms. Now, Michael Gable had a few different insurance policies, but getting them to pay up was not easy. Although the coroner had determined that the cause of death was asphyxiation, the manner of death remained undetermined for some time. There are four manners of death. Natural causes, accident, suicide, or homicide. Clearly this wasn't a case of natural causes, and it would take quite some mental gymnastics for a reasonable person to accept that he had accidentally wrapped himself in cling wrap and just forgot to rip it off before he died. There was a suicide note, but Dr. Miller found it hard to accept that a person would commit suicide in such a strange way, saying at trial that he would not have been able to resist clawing and pulling at the cling wrap as his air supply ran out. He also noted that one of the blows that Michael had sustained knocked him unconscious. The police brought in a fireman to try to demonstrate whether or not a person could even wrap their own head as tightly as Michael's had been. There were no air pockets at all. The fireman was able to wrap his head like Michael's, but only after multiple attempts. He did not, of course, leave the saran wrap in place long enough to lose consciousness. After reviewing all the interviews and physical evidence, the coroner ultimately concluded that the only manner of death that made sense under the circumstances was homicide. In the meantime, Michael had a number of insurance policies which totaled $375,000. He had one policy for $100,000 that Jean had become the owner of back in 2007. In other words, she had bought the policy from Michael. The owner of a life insurance policy has control over all the policy's rights. They can, for example, change the beneficiary or lower the amount of coverage. Jean had already borrowed against the policy on two occasions. After Michael's death, she changed the beneficiary from herself to her adult son from her previous marriage. The policy eventually paid out $56,000. Police found out that the son had then signed the check back over to her. In February of 2013, she bought a cashier's check for $5,000 and gave it to her son. She started a new bank account with the rest of the money, and by the same time the following year, there was only $100 left in that account. As for the other two policies, the insurance companies were highly suspicious of Jean, and she had to hire a lawyer to get them to pay. The policies were settled on the condition that Jean not get any of the proceeds. This case was literally a matter of following the money. Lieutenant Molner of the Avon Police Department went over reports of the couple's checking accounts both before and after Michael's death. Jean spent a lot of money on unnecessary knickknacks, and she didn't let the fact that she ran out of money keep her from spending it. Their checking balance was just a sea of red, $216 in overdraft fees in February of 2011 and $187 in overdraft fees for March. This continued even after Michael's passing. She racked up $315 in penalty fees in September of 2011, even though she'd gotten an increase in Social Security benefits and therefore had more income. The police also weren't buying the suicide note. CSI had found Jean's DNA on it, but that didn't really mean anything because she told the police that she'd opened and read it. It just seemed strange that a person would type out a suicide note on a computer, sign it in ink, and even type their name again beneath the signature like a business document. It seemed more likely that Michael would have handwritten that letter. 
He had been a car salesman for several years and always wrote up his orders by hand. Jean, on the other hand, was a secretary. When the police went through the five computers found in the home, there were lots of documents prepared by Jean. She always left a blank line for her handwritten signature and then typed her full name beneath it. The police brought in a handwriting expert to see if the signature on the suicide note was authentic. Although the expert found some differences between the signature and other papers known to be signed by Michael Gable, he wasn't able to conclude one way or another who had signed the suicide letter. Jean Harrington remained free on bail throughout the course of her trial. The prosecutor described Jean as a greedy, reckless spender who blamed Michael for all their financial problems instead of taking responsibility for her own behavior. It came out at trial that there had been a time, years before, when Michael's gambling had gotten out of control and the couple had to mortgage their rental properties to pay off his debts. But Michael had gotten a second job and worked hard to set things right. It was Jean's wild spending, he argued, not Michael's debts that had caused them to lose their house. But the looming foreclosure was the final straw. The Benadryl in Michael's system was proof that Jean had put some planning into the killing. And when they argued in the middle of the night, Michael was at a disadvantage. The prosecutor's theory at trial was that Jean had tased him so she could bind his hands and ankles. At that point, she wrapped his head in cling wrap and let him suffocate, alternately beating and tasing him whenever he started to wake up again and regain his strength. She then untied him and wrote the phony suicide note. Prosecutor Tony Chillo said, this is about staging a body to destroy a man's legacy. Gene was represented by Troy Reeves. He argued that Michael was a depressed man hopelessly addicted to gambling and drowning in debt. There was the IRS debt, the collections, and now they were losing their home thanks to his addiction. Even Michael's adult daughter testified that his gambling played a huge role in the breakup of his last marriage. It's important to note that the prosecutor called one of Michael's most recent poker buddies to the stand. He testified that they only played for small stakes and the most anyone could win was about $20 a night. The defense argued that the autopsy didn't show a homicide. Dr. Eric Vey testified that none of the injuries to Michael's body caused any loss of consciousness and that it could not be determined when he received all those burn marks, rug burns, and bruises. He had been working in the house. Who knows if he banged his arm on something, pinched a finger, or hit his head earlier? Also, why didn't CSI find any of Gene's DNA on the inside of the saran wrap, the part of the plastic that was actually touching his face? If she had really wound that spool of plastic around and around and around his head, wouldn't they find a fingerprint of hers or some skin cells? The defense's handwriting expert testified that the signature on the suicide note was authentic. The differences that the police examiner had found were natural variations, not evidence of forgery. A few of Michael's co-workers were called by the defense to talk about the strained relationship between him and Jean. This was done to show that Michael was not just stressing about money, but unhappy at home as well and lacking the support he needed to keep from taking his own life. One co-worker even said that Michael once told him that if he was going to kill himself, he just put a bag over his head and get it over with. On cross-examination, however, the witness put these comments in context. He said that they were all talking about a suicide that had been in the news and that Michael had followed up that statement by saying he would never do anything like that because of how it would impact his son. All the co-workers testified that Michael was very close to his son and very proud of him. They all said they couldn't imagine him taking his own life and leaving his son alone like that. After all those witnesses, the defense rested. Gene Harrington was convicted of all counts on May the 2nd, 2016. Judge Raymond Ewers sentenced her to a term of 16 years to life on May 11th, 2016. She appealed. 
On June the 3rd of 2018, the Ninth District Court of Appeals upheld her conviction. She is currently a resident at the Dayton Correctional Institution. The date set for her first meeting with the parole board is October of 2031. It's been my pleasure examining this case with you. Please join me again soon for another true crime story time. Good night.